and welcome to the Cincy Library Film Club. My name is Ben Lathrop from the Information and Reference Department at the Main Library. With me is my co-host, Ann Driscoll. Hello. Uh, as a reminder of how this works, we choose a title from the great selection of movies that are available to stream for free with your library card. We'll announce it a few uh, days in advance and then meet back here to discuss it every other Tuesday night at 7 o'clock on Facebook. Please uh, post all your questions and comments in the post, and we'll do our best to answer them. Tonight, we are talking about The Castle of Cagliostro, which is the first film uh, directed by renowned animator Hayao Miyazaki. It's a whirlwind adventure story featuring the gentleman thief Arsene Lupin III, who sets his sights on a master counterfeiter, only to be quickly wrapped up in a crazy plot to steal the fabled treasure of Cagliostro. This movie rarely takes a breath. It rolls seamlessly from one spectacular action sequence to the next. Uh, and sort of try to get a, the flavor of this back in our mouths, as it were, let's take a look at one of the first very tightly staged car chase through the alpine roads of Cagliostro. Nest, Jay Caligayan. Uh, Jay is also the founder of the No Theater and one of the founders of the Cincinnati Fringe Festival. Welcome, Jay. Mm -hmm. Well, Welcome, thanks Jay. for having me. Thank you. Big fan of the series, and uh, thanks for picking this. This is one of my favorite movies. Excellent. Okay. Well, so, Jay, before we talk about tonight's movie, tell us about Mest. So, Mest is uh, it's the nickname for the Metropolitan Sewer District. M-E-S-S-E-D, and uh, it's kind of, uh, we, we kind of feature a sewer worker named Lily Put, and she's our tour guide to the weird, wet, wild world beneath our feet. So it takes place in the sewers. It's uh, kind of uh, this great feature of uh, this world that we don't know anything about. I kind of describe it as uh, Tank Girl meets Tremors, you know, like the big sandworm <laughs> and the Tremors. So Tank Girl meets Tremors. And, uh, and it's uh, just my favorite kind of science fiction, honestly, is science fiction that has an element to the familiar. So here we have this system that we contribute to every day, whether uh, going to the restroom, washing your vegetables, doing your laundry, the water just flows. And that's what uh, sewer workers like Lilliput do is that uh, they keep the flow. <laughs> <laughs> what's well, great. How did you, um, but you're the, so you're the writer of this comic. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, Dylan Spieg, uh, also out of Cincinnati, he is our uh, main illustrator. Great. And how, how did that partnership start? So uh, whenever I do anything new, I uh, take a lot of meetings. I just meet with a lot of different people and talk to them about what they know or uh, who they might know or ask their opinions and feedback on different things. And uh, I, saw, I saw Dylan Spieg. Uh, we were both at the Cincinnati Art Museum. Uh, and we had our kids and I was like, Hey, do you know anyone who does panel to panel storytelling? And he's like, yeah, <laughs> me. <laughs> so, and he did some work for sci, uh, sci-fi network and, uh, some panel to panel storytelling, uh, just starting. So I gave him the script and he did a couple of pages and it was terrific. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he's, uh, we're on season three right now. He's working on that. Uh, but he's been our main illustrator ever since. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I should probably just insert real quick here. We do have uh, holds are now available uh, to be requested at the library, and we do have um, volumes of the graphic novel version, uh, the the collected trades that is uh, in the catalog. I'll be putting a link in the feed. I'm telling you, that was a kind of a life goals. <laughs> Get into the library. I'm, this is my library, and I was I was very proud to be in it. And That's you great. also uh, showcased your work at the Cincinnati Comic Expo, is that right? That's correct. We do uh, a lot of Comic Cons, trade shows, art craft fairs uh, throughout, uh, throughout probably I would say the tri-state area, Virginia Beach, uh, trying to go all around wherever we can go. So mm -hmm. uh, in this time of COVID, for the safety of everyone, a lot of the Comic Cons have canceled, unfortunately. So uh, we're just trying to get our uh, work out there as best we can, but it has been a little bit difficult uh, since there's no way to, uh, no opportunities to talk to people. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you, you have a website where you post a lot about what events you're doing and also blog entries and free uh, excerpts from chapters of your book. And that is correct. What's that the URL correct. to that? It's uh, Mest Comics, M E S S E D C O M I C S dot com. Cool. Great. And I think you do have footage because you did sort of a. Um, uh, a, a live action encounter version of the comic a couple years ago. Is, is yeah, it- uh, Dylan Dylan Spieg, he uh, took his artwork and he's always been playing with animation and he's done a couple of jobs using animation. So uh, he uh, took six months and uh, animated uh, his artwork. So it's a messed animated video to the music of Heavy Hinges, Miss Wright. So he's in a band called Heavy Hinges and they use a song called Miss Right and it's absolutely terrific. Uh, when, I was, when I was younger, uh, things like uh, Miyazaki films, Akira, uh, those kind of things really just helped introduce me to the next level of animation. And then there was also a music video by Matthew Sweet called uh, Girlfriend. Oh, and, definitely. Uh, With Cobra, Space space Agent Cobra. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, and that was one of my other just because it was, um, it was hard to get anime uh, or they called it Japanimation back then. <laughs> uh, it was hard to get those things back then. So it was videotapes and MTV were doing those Matthew Sweet videos, which, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, obviously great song, but uh, just seeing that animation was just, uh, just kind of a, kind of just inspiring honestly yeah how would you describe the growth of the influence of manga and anime in popular culture today versus you know where it was 30 40 50 years ago oh you go to a bookstore let's call it a big box store let's say like a barnes and noble or joseph beth a local branch and there are two at least two to three shelves I'm, I'm talking like the entire shelf of, uh, of manga. And uh, it's just amazing how, uh, but when you went to bookstores when I was a kid, they might have had Watchmen. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. They might have had Dark Knight Returns. And those are, let's say, those are English or American stories. So the fact is that graphic novels have really taken off in the mainstream. And uh, manga is a probably a huge reason for that there's a couple articles that come out that say uh manga and uh scholastic novels like bone or guts or Mm. uh roller girl uh, they they're outselling superheroes in the bookstores oh definitely baby mouse and uh, diary wimpy kid and captain underpants is like the best-selling comic book that exists yeah uh i went to cxc and um uh, the the creator who is the creator of uh, Wimpy Kid or Diary of Wimpy Kid? I'm or no, no, I'm sorry. My, uh... It's Captain Underpants. The creator of Captain Underpants. He had a line around the Ohio State Theater twice. Like the line went twice around because oh, yeah. they were so excited to see him and so many families. It was wonderful. Oh, that's awesome. Uh. Well, so you mentioned, you know, being a fan of, of Miyazaki's work. I know, like, we've, we've talked about that in the past. What, what is it about his work that sets him apart from, you know, this other kind of broader world of, of fantasy work and animation? I think he painstakingly works through every single scene. And his method of storytelling uh, just... Uh, really just takes its time. And then in his creative process, he he really just goes over every little detail. There was a, a PBS is showing a, a three-part uh, Miyazaki documentary uh, in the process of his work. And the, the movie Ponyo, they talked about the scene in Ponyo. And he meticulously describes uh, this just this hug between uh, Ponyo and the boy, and uh, it talks about how the boy's raincoat kind of just folds from the hug because that's how intense the hug is. Mm-hmm. And it, it's these small little details, but uh, you know he's talking about it, and they, he goes over it with his staff like uh, day and night, and just just to get that scene just right. So there's a, there's just kind of these meticulous details. Uh, I was thinking about uh, Castle and uh, the chase scene for the car uh, that you're talking about, and uh, when the car lands into the water, you see the water and there's so much detail oh, yeah. just fly about. 
and the, and it, we're talking about 1979. So this is all hand drawn. I mean, mm-hmm. and <laughs> you can save a lot of shortcuts and you're like, Oh no, no, no. We need those details, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's a good way of putting it. The thing that, you know, rewatching this one, uh, that sort of came back to me is that it's, it's so much the framing and the scope of it is so much like a, you know, it's like a, like a live action, big budget stunt movie, but it does have like it, all the, all the characters and all the objects moving through the frame, um, you know, are treated with that kind of like that live action cinematic way, even though it's, it's rendered by hand. And a lot of other animation seems like, like you said, for cost reasons, they're, they're cutting corners. They're just animating the figure in front of the background. They're not putting those other touches in there or the, the tiniest uh, things like you're saying, like the, the movement of cloth, those little gestures around the eyes, all those kind of things. So you feel like you know, you're, watching a, you're watching real people that just happen to be drawn people. Yeah, and I mean, uh, the other thing that, especially for Castle, uh, the research... I mean, we're looking at all the Gothic architecture, the Roman oh, architecture. Yeah. I, there's just a lot of research that goes into that. Uh, I think that you can watch Castle and just be entertained. But there's, if you really look into the detail and the design, uh, there's so much more into that. I think he does that especially with um, uh, Castle in the Sky, another uh, later one of his films, where he just has it, it you you could just watch it and it just looks like action adventure. But if mm-hmm. you really look at it, especially the opening sequence where he just has all the different air machines and all the different air cities, there's just so much that goes into that. Uh, I think with the comic book, he's a great inspiration with me for my comic book mist in that I took at least a year just researching, talking to different sewer workers, taking tours of plants and just just really building up that research uh, and uh, knowing the language that they speak because I, I think that makes for a more thorough story. I mean, I love an improv story that's, you know, on the cusp and just, you know, off the sleeve and that kind of thing. But like really doing that research can uh, give you just a little bit more depth to uh, what might seem like a simple story. Yeah. Yeah. So the, about the storytelling, um, Mm -hmm. there's elements to it that seem to be drawn from fairy tales. Um, the, the film is about the quest to procure a magical ring, which reminded me of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> the damsel in distress, stuck in a medieval, medieval tower. Um, so I was just wondering what your thoughts were on how Miyazaki draws from these different storytelling tropes and if he, if he blends like Western and maybe Eastern Japanese folklore traditions and if you have any thoughts on that aspect. Uh, okay, so you two might know this quote better than I do. Uh, Mark Twain. Uh, kaleidoscope of ideas. There are no new ideas, but you put them in the kaleidoscope and just kind of uh, come up with something new. So you take all the old ideas and just like uh, turn it around. So absolutely, you're taking a a lot of iconic uh, storytelling elements and just mixing it up. But uh, what I like about it is the style uh, that he does. So uh, we talk about the kinetic nature of uh, the car chase or uh, the auto gyro. So the auto gyro, you know, it's just a plain, plain helicopter thing, but mm-hmm. the design of it. And then he does, I think it's the second time it starts up. Uh, the engine turns, there's a little smoke from the exhaust and then it goes into the <laughs> color and just kind of comes out. So it's just mm-hmm. gorgeous. And uh, so, yes, if you boil it down, it's damsel in distress, a little bit of the Lord of the Rings. I mean, yeah, you can totally like uh, take from that. Uh, but I think that it's it's just the new perspective that they lend to it. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's yeah. definitely a unique tone. Um, and also, I I'm curious about the allegorical aspects of it um, because there's an aspect to it that's about like financial conspiracies. Like he's infiltrating this castle that mm-hmm. is printing counterfeit money, and uh, that is, Cagliostro is blackmailing yeah. the world. Is bla- yeah, exactly. <laughs> he goes yeah, to the and, UN. And, um, the best is so he he blends so many different things so sometimes you're like okay you're in europe 
Uh, but then you're like, oh, wait, they're eating udon noodles. So I'm like, <laughs> what the heck? And then uh, they, they, if you, and I'm talking about the English translation, uh, they're like, and Japanese yen when they're talking about the counterfeit money and stuff. So it's like, it's such an interesting blend. And I think he, he definitely, uh, throughout his career, takes stories uh, from a lot of European stories, fairy tales, uh, different things like that, like Ponyo and mm-hmm. uh, uh, even Spirit well, he he'd adapted uh, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, I think, and um, some other science fiction and fantasy writers and novelists. Um, Lupin the Third, the the main character in this film, although I think the the canopy version just calls him Wolf because of copyright stuff. Yeah. Um, so that was also an adaptation of a, an older comic book from Japan that itself was this pastiche where uh, Arsène Lupin the first, I guess, was a pulp character from the 1900s in France uh, that got adapted into the comic book where it's his grandson who's less successful and more licentious. And that's that's the, the goofy Lupin the third and all his cronies um, running these kind of James Bond capers. Uh, and then his adaptation of that in this kind of calms Lupin down so he's not he's not the um scoundrel that he is in the in the comic as much as uh his kind of the sort of Miyazaki like puckish youthful hero that that you start to see (laughs) in the other one the trickster thief yeah 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 Yeah, totally Uh, I was reading uh a couple of reviews and uh, that's one of them say like everyone really uh, appreciated it they really love the work but some people are like well he's not as ruthless as a thief you know and I was just like I mean I guess it just depends on what you're looking for because mm-hmm. I have not admit, I've not honestly had an uh, opportunity to explore the other Lupins uh, and uh, just uh, the other uh, variations of the character. This is to me is the iconic uh, yeah. version of him. Yeah, he's much easier to root for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is a moment in the with the, he and his and his partner are having spaghetti, and he makes some crack about being a womanizer to the waitress. Um, <laughs> yeah. whole whole episodes are about that scene I think in the earlier version so so that's much uh, it's nicer that he kind of moves on he's a little more pure of heart uh, well every so altruistic. often every so often well okay so number one let's talk about Miyazaki and food for some reason he has the innate ability to position take his time around meals where they're doing a thing called ma. And what I love about ma, it's a phrase where they're kind of summing up what's happened so far, just giving the audience time to take Mm -hmm. a breath. But usually he also does it over food. So like there's just this like delicious food going on. The meatballs and spaghetti when they're eating the udon noodles. Um, Oh, yeah. I mean, it just like it makes you hungry. I mean, what kind of animator, (laughs) what kind of animator can make you hungry? Yeah. (laughs) You watch Beauty and the Beast and uh, all the the teapot and all the all the furniture are moving around and they're creating mm-hmm. a meal. That does that. I'm like, oh, that's nice. And that was amusing. Good number. But it doesn't make you hungry. And somehow Miyazaki is able to trigger that. Oh, definitely. Well, you know, it, it's that's an interesting point because it, it not only works in uh, that kind of like um, – story business way right so you've got everybody kind of recapping the the plot which is pretty convoluted and and loose anyway um (laughs) but then it's also this great opportunity for him to do all that other stylistic stuff he does those flourishes so like noodles animating noodles is fantastic trick to pull off because there's so much movement that he can get and the steam and everything and um yeah, it's just a, it's kind of a nice way to show off and actually like get some practical business done for the story at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it plays on your senses. It's just a uh, potent imagery, and I think about other um, fantastical worlds and how food is can be so essential to that world building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and humanizes everybody, right? Mm-hmm. The yeah. Speaking uh, of imagery, I'm the film is definitely playful and whimsical at times, but also kind of grotesque and haunting in other, at other times. And I've, I've felt that um, watching like Spirited Away as well. But like one, one thing that kind of struck me as sort of strange and bizarre was um, the ninja security guards. Um, but also the, uh, the motion detector surveillance lasers. Um, we're <laughs> quite sinister. Um, we do have an example 
of that juxtaposition uh, between playful and sort of bizarre um, in a scene where Lupin, he tries to comfort the princess uh, by presenting a flower to her, um, but then it transitions into a scene where they're being attacked by the guards. So we can play that clip. And, you know, way to like make it interesting. And uh, with the claw hands, I mean, what a, what a great design. And I think that I think that captures uh, a family's uh, if a family's watching it, it captures a kid's imagination. And like, what is this? And then yeah. they reveal later what they are. You know, they seem like these creatures, but then later on, they're revealed to be like hench people, henchmen. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's revealed by his. Uh, um, I for, I forget the character's name, but he just happens to have a buddy that's a samurai. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wish I had a friend who was a samurai too that would just hang out and get me out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, at the end, he sort of, he cuts the, the uniforms off the ninjas or whatever they are. Yeah, so you the, see that it's just armor and uh, you see the faces and mm -hmm. they're just people. But I mean, uh, what a way to present them. And uh, mm -hmm. you, you get a fear because so many times, you know, you watch your Arnold Schwarzenegger or your Bruce Willis or whatever action star you're watching and you feel like they're not even challenged by these hench people. And uh, there's a scene, the scene you showed in the bedroom, but there's also that scene in the um, in the hotel they're at where they get attacked by the first oh, appearance yeah. of those hench people. And uh, it's just amazing just to see just they're they can beat up like 20 of them, but it, t it took some effort. <laughs> it mm -hmm. took some effort for them. So, yeah. Instant well, that's another great one. Insect like also sorry oh know. insect yeah a little insect there yeah definitely and i think there's a just a great way to a great way to create more of beyond just your typical villain you know and yeah. created those kind of things when uh the count comes out in that costume <laughs> like the purple with the cape and everything like that oh, uh -huh. i was like oh okay here we go <laughs> But it matches it matches those guards, those uh, assassins. <laughs> yeah, just, it elevates to this like border of the uncanny that's just enough. And that's that's kind of something I thought was interesting with this one is a lot of his other films are are pretty full bore into the fantastic, yeah, uh, like Spirited Away and and uh, Princess Mononoke, where where you know we're we're dealing with obvious mythology. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it's in that kind of you know our are they monsters? Is there some kind of weird occult thing going on? Or is it just, um, you know, a villain in a castle with some dramatic flair <laughs> to work? <laughs> well, um, are there any other scenes that uh, come to mind? That one in the hotel, I think, is a great one. It's very, you know, tightly plotted and feels like, you know, that's this classic buddy action team up where it, you know douse the light they're coming and then they all they all bust in is there anything else that we haven't talked about that's uh, coming to mind jay i think that uh there's something to be said about uh his partners um uh that they they have their own abilities they have they're able to fight they're not like helpless without them in fact mm -hmm. uh, uh in fact lupin needs them you know so uh, i love the fact that they're on equal footing like yeah. uh, Lupin's a leader, but they they are fine on their own. In fact, Lupin needs them, <laughs> or else he mm. could have escaped. He would have died. <laughs> so I mean, I think there is something to be said about that. Uh, the other the other thing I would say is again the architecture. If you just want to show some of the scenes uh, of, the, of the castle itself, I mean, mm. we talk about design by a uh, design by a madman or uh, M. C. Escher, the clock tower especially. Uh, just just gears everywhere but it, it really is like it's another just another pile on these examples of how he is just putting it's not just like the design it's the movement like everything is moving all the time and it just that's a great climax for the movie of just well we're gonna have nothing but infinite tower of turning wheels of different <laughs> styles that we can dance on and what have you and um, uh, and think about this that was hand drawn I mean, it wasn't because, oh, yeah. you know, you know, they'd be using computers today if they were going to do a clock scene, clock tower scene. I mean, and that was hand drawn. I mean, mm -hmm. just can't beat that. And all that timing so that all the gears, it looks even though like you said there's no logic to it. It does look like it could work. Yeah. <laughs> all, all the all the teeth fit into each other and what have you. 
And then um, every so often there's that dark, there's a little bit of darkness in uh, uh, Miyazaki films. I mean, it's no Akira or it's, you know, it's no Ninja Scroll, uh, which has so much ultra violence, but uh, the, where the henchman gets caught in the gears, they kind of pan away <laughs> like real quick, yeah. they pan away, but you're like, you know what happened? And you're like, Oh, yeah. or what happens to the count? <laughs> I think you know, it's like flat. oh Lupin even says something like don't look <laughs> <I know. laughs> right before it happens <laughs> but they don't uh, but they they show that there is violence in this world and there's consequences mm-hmm. and so yeah <laughs> uh well do you have any uh recommendations for anybody watching of uh if they, if they enjoyed Castle Cagley or Astro or there's some other uh classic animated titles or Miyazaki movies you'd suggest? So, uh, Nausicaa, uh, in the Valley of the Wind. And I think I'm saying Nausicaa wrong is amazing. He did a graphic novel, uh, series about it and then turned it into a film. So if you get a chance, the graphic novels are available at the library, of course. And, uh, and then you watch the film and, uh, he, it really shows his love of air and flight. I think mm. he does that that's especially and then uh for just adventure uh kind of those indiana jones the the car chase from castle scene uh is castle in the sky he just does an amazing job and then uh i would say that his characters i think are more balanced in castle in the sky mm. so you you can easily make an argument that the princess was not uh on the same uh control as say lupin or any of the other characters Mm -hmm. but i think with castle in the sky i think a lot of the characters are uh very empowered and um granny uh, i forget her real name but granny in castle in the sky uh plays a a pirate queen and she is hilarious and just has so much (laughs) character behind her so Mm -hmm. like i think that that's something to be said so uh one of the things that uh i did uh so I have two daughters and one of the honors I have uh, being a parent is I get to introduce them to the things I love. And so, you know, Star Wars and different novels and, and then, but as you do that, you start to see that some of the things that you loved might not have been as equal. Like maybe they're all homogenized as far as mm. one race or yeah. maybe uh, gender parody, maybe like uh, one of the characters just, it's very helpless throughout the entire time and they're just being rescued. Yeah. And so what I like about the Miyazaki films is I, I rediscovered them and reintroduce and introduce them to my daughters is because I think they have very uh, empowered characters throughout mm-hmm. uh, whether despite gender, despite uh, race, you know, that kind of thing. And that's also why I created the comic book. Cause I wanted yeah. to create a strong character who happens to be female, who happens to be Asian. Mm-hmm. And uh, I get the pleasure of bringing my kids with me to the comic book store and they get to see <laughs> Lily put the main character of mess on yep. the, on the shelves. Or even uh, cosplayed on occasion, right? Yes. Or even cosplayed. So yeah, <laughs> it, it, so I, not only am I trying to discover new things that are good influences on uh, my children and good influences on me, I'm also trying to create those things as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jay, for taking the time for us. And thanks to everybody out there who's watching us along. Join us this week. If you're enjoying these discussions, please let us know by liking the post, putting your comments below. And please help us spread the word. Tell all your friends that this is going on. We'll be back Tuesday, July 7th uh, with musician Zach Taylor, who's going to be joining us to talk about Lenny Abrahamson's indie music comedy, Frank, uh, which is available to stream on Canopy through the library. For updates and more info, uh, check out the link below at sinlib.org slash filmclublive, and we hope to see you next time.